Explores. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. It's 19 CE, and a packed crowd waits under a steely sky at the port town of Brundisium for one of Rome's favorite imperial daughters to appear on the shore. Sixty years before, this place saw Mark Antony and Octavian strike up an important treaty, one sealed by our old friend Octavia. That was a day of feasting and celebration, but this is a day of mourning. They watch as a ship arrives and a woman disembarked. Two of her children stand beside her, eyes cast down in sadness. Her eyes brim with grief for her husband, whose ashes lie in the urn she holds between her hands. And she doesn't bother to hide it. She wants everyone to see. And as to the rumors that her husband didn't just die, but was murdered, she will do nothing to quell the flames of those. In fact, she's going to fan them, because she believes that Emperor Tiberius is responsible for her husband's murder and she's going to make him pay for what he's done. Daughter of Rome's most venerated war hero, favorite granddaughter of its first emperor, wife of one of the most shining imperial stars, Agrippina the Elder was born to be famous. She came of age at the empire's very beginning, into its ruling dynasty, thrust into the spotlight whether she wanted to bask in it or not. But she also made her own spotlight, always fighting for what she believed in, and against those who would do her family harm. But in the early days of the Roman Empire, a spotlight can also be a target. Her fame and her name gave her real influence, but they came at a mighty cost. To her, to her husband, and to her children. This is a story of a very public life, full of drama and heartache, restriction and adventure anxiety and a fury she wouldn't contain. It's the story of some of Rome's most formidable women, doing things that women had never done in Rome before. Lucky for us, we have some familiar time-traveling companions with us on this journey. I am Dr. G. I am a Roman historian who specializes in the Festal Virgins. And I am Dr. Red, and I specialize in all things historical filmy. <laughs> And we're very pleased to be joining the Explorers on the journey through the lives of Roman women today. You're going to hear a lot more from them in our next episode than in this one, but I'm excited to have them along for the ride. Grab your purple silk, a shiny sword, and a marble urn. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My newest pirate queens, Emma, Jamie, Alma, Victoria, Cecilia, Michaela, Yolanda, Christina, Shauna, Sarah H., Patricia, Bailey, and my friends over at Queen's Podcast. My newest lady presidents, Jennifer, Paige, Abigail, and Petra. My boss lady, Faye and Whimsy Soapworks. My adventuresses, Lizzie, Samantha, Jessica S., Karen C., and Alexis. My warrior queen, Avery, and my lady pharaoh, Courtney. Thanks to all my patrons, I couldn't make the show without you. Supporting the Explores over on Patreon will give you access to exclusive bonus content. If you're listening to this as it airs, in October 2020, I just posted a spooky Halloween bonus all about the women involved in France's Affair of the Poisons. You'll also find sneak peeks, discounts on merchandise, special prizes, polls, and more. To check it out, just go to my website. And now, on to Ancient Rome. To really get this story started, we need to back up and rake over some of the coals we burned through in our last few episodes. You didn't think we were done with Livia yet, did you? So if you haven't listened to the first two episodes in our Augusta series, then get out of here and go do that. This is also the place that I need to remind you that to talk about these women, we have to talk a lot about the men in their lives. 
The sources we have on these ladies are scanty to begin with, and we're forced to see them through the lenses of writers trying to tell tales about the emperors they're attached to, using them as tools for comment on their fitness as leaders. So, there's a real lack of sources, and the ones we have are… judgmental. We'll come back to this as we travel, but it's important to keep it tucked in the back of your mind. Let's touch down in 14 BCE. Thirteen years ago, the Senate handed Octavian some extraordinary powers, gifting him with the title of Augustus. He's been basically running the Roman Empire ever since. In 21, he married his only natural-born child, the wily Julia, to his best friend Marcus Agrippa. Since then, Julia has been dutifully popping out babies, mothering the next generation of the Julio-Claudian clan. Julia sometimes travels with her wayfaring husband, and in October of that year she joins him in Athens. It's there that she gives birth to a girl named Vipsania Agrippina. Well, that's a mouthful. Let's talk about Roman names for a minute. We've covered this before, but a little refresher will only help us as we bushwhack our way into the Julio-Claudian tree. Roman men have three to four names. There's the nomen, or family name, which tells everyone which gens you belong to. There's the praenomen, which is kind of like a first name. It's the one only your family will call you by. There's sometimes a cognomen, or nickname, that speaks to a physical characteristic. Maximus, for example, means tall or large. And sometimes there's a fourth name, the agnomen, or honorific title. Remember Scipio Africanus, Cornelia's dad? His full name was Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. First name, family name, nickname. Scipio means he who bears the staff of authority. And the honorific Africanus, given to him because of military successes in Africa. In ancient Rome, names aren't just for decoration. They identify where you come from and who you're connected to, and so they hold a special kind of power. In this patriarchal world, children take on their paterfamilias' gens name, which is why we have so many same-name children, especially with the ladies. Women tend to get only two names, both related to her father. Agrippa's full name is Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, and that's how our gal ends up with Vipsania Agrippina. Lucky her. She grows up surrounded by many siblings. Two older brothers, Gaius and Lucius, an elder sister Julia, and an annoying younger brother named Agrippa Posthumus. They are children of the post-Republican era, who have only ever known a Rome in which one man ruled. And that man just so happens to be their grandpa and their paterfamilias. Life as an imperial child has definite benefits, but it also has particular perils. Augustus is the richest man in the empire, and by far the most powerful. And so, as one of his favored grandchildren, Agrippina grows up surrounded by attention and interest, basking in the glow of his reflected light. Given all that, you'd think she would have a fairly easy childhood. But it's full of painful drama from pretty much the very start. Augustus thinks a lot about who is going to fill his shoes once he bites it. Sure, Rome isn't technically a monarchy, but after almost 40 years as Imperator, most Romans can't remember life being any other way. There's still a Senate, of course, even if, by this point, it's more lazy, rich boys club than anything like a governing body. But even without it, few people would be likely to complain. After decades of civil war, Rome is finally peaceful. Under Augustus, it's cleaner, better organized, better fed. But if he doesn't organize a well-placed and prepped successor, everything he's built could fall apart once he's gone. He could die at any time. And if he does, who will carry on his mantle? No sons, that's for sure. He hasn't managed to have any. So he's always on the lookout for potential heirs to adopt. Livia, of course, is forever campaigning for her son Tiberius. And though Augustus has been his stepdad for pretty much as long as Tiberius can remember, he doesn't seem to like him much. We met Tiberius in our last episode, but let's turn the spotlight up on him for a minute, because he's going to play a major part in Agrippina's life. I don't date, so I'm not sure why I've been required to write this, but <sighs> here we are. I'm something of an underdog, the one everyone's always trying to kick under the table. I don't know why they're all so hateful. I'm perfectly charming. I like long, contemplative walks, island vacations, and reading quietly. My perfect Saturday night is me, curled up with a book. But instead, 
My world is full of loud, overbearing females. So what if I exile a few of them to the islands? So does my stepdad, and everyone loves him anyway. It's so unfair, and everything is terrible. When Agrippina is born, Tiberius is in his late twenties, in a position of supreme power and privilege. But still, he hasn't had the easiest go of it. He lived most of his early life in exile on the run with his parents. His childhood and youth were beset with hardships and difficulties, wrote Suetonius. Because Nero, his father, and Livia took him wherever they went in their flight from Augustus. Remember that part, his parents were running from Augustus, the man that, years later, his mom will leave her husband for. Then, at age nine, his dad dies, leaving Augustus as his only father figure. And though his stepdad let Tiberius ride beside him in one of his military triumphs, he never fully takes him under his wing. Instead, he favored another boy, Marcellus. He was bright and lively, while by all accounts Tiberius was unhandsome, sour-faced, slow of speech, and an all-around Eeyore character. He lives forever in Augustus' shadow, suffering from his constant disappointment and indifference. At least he has his mom, Livia. Though we get the sense going forward that she's a little bit of a hoverer. More on that later. But it's not all doom and gloom. Back in 20 BCE, Augustus threw a 22-year-old Tiberius a bone by sending him to Armenia to replace a monarch there. He proved a good commander, but even then Augustus didn't seem all that enthused. In 19, he married Vipsania Agrippina. Wait, our Vipsania Agrippina? No, she isn't born yet. This is one of Agrippa's daughters from his first marriage. I told you Roman names were confusing. Let's just call her Vipsania for clarity's sake. Though probably not of Tiberius' choosing, it's a happy marriage, something to distract him when, two years later, Augustus announces he's adopting some sons, and they aren't him. It's young Agrippina's older brothers, Gaius and Lucius, whom he's grooming as his successors. The emperor pulls his grandsons close, teaching them to read and swim and sign documents in the same style as he does. But young Agrippina is much beloved herself. Augustus writes her affectionate letters, praising her intelligence, though he also advises her to cultivate a simpler writing style. Augustus, king of the micromanage. How does Livia feel about all this? Behind the scenes, she has to be pursing her lips and biting her tongue about her husband's cold shoulder toward Tiberius. But maybe she's just biding her time. So that's Tiberius' situation. All is going pretty well for Agrippina, until her dad, Agrippa, dies in 12 BCE. She never has the chance to get to know him. What's worse, his death means she'll spend the rest of her childhood in Augustus's house, under his extremely controlling thumb and exacting standards. He has his granddaughters taught to spin and weave like proper matrons. He also keeps them quite isolated, separate from most people, but still forbids them from doing anything that can't be witnessed by a crowd. Someone, he says, is always watching. Nothing about your life is yours alone. Augustus is devastated to lose Agrippa, his oldest, most trusted friend. And if Augustus died, he was supposed to help Gaius and Lucius out as a sort of regent until they were old enough to take care of things themselves. So now what? He needs another older heir to groom, just to cover all his bases. Cue Olivia sidling up to him for the millionth time to say, Have you thought about Tiberius? Augustus is reluctant to entrust his legacy to a boy with, as he put it, such slow grinding jaws. But he's running out of options and he trusts Livia. He can't do much else but agree. To tie his stepson into the family more tightly, he forces Agrippina's mom Julia to marry him. Agrippina is only a few years old when her mom is married off, again, to a man not of her choosing. Suetonius tells us that Julia had a passion for him even while Agrippa was still living, but truth be told, I think she's unhappy about this development. By law, she should have been allowed to retire with her trust fund and enjoy life as an independent lady by now. But Dad Augustus sees her as a tool, one that it's his right to use. He's forced to divorce Vipsania, and he is not okay with it. It's said that afterward, when he sees Vipsania in the street one day, he almost bursts into tears. Oh, Tiberius. 
So now Tiberius is technically Agrippina's stepdad. How much time does she spend with him? Not much, I'd wager. Between 12 and 6 BCE, he sent off to achieve some military greatness in Rome's provinces, leaving Julia back in Rome to raise the kids alone. He never asked for an adoptive daughter, and why even try when he knows he could never measure up to Agrippa in the eyes of either Julia or Augustus? This guy is already bitter, and he's going to get bitterer still. As far as we know, Agrippina doesn't feel any real connection with this man who all but abandons her mother. Of course I don't. That guy sucks. But she grows up watching a growing resentment simmering under her mother's skin, working its way slowly to the surface. She is sick of being caged by her position and her father's stringent expectations. So she escapes when she can, becoming the star in her own version of Roman Holiday, except featuring a whole lot more nudity. By 7 BCE, she is causing a heaping helping of scandal, indulging in affairs and not bothering to hide them. And then, in 6 BCE, Tiberius drops a bomb that blows up the whole family. You know what? I don't even want to be your successor. I'm going to Rhodes to kick back with a fat stack of books and just chill. Why the bold move? Perhaps he's sick of being Augustus's Constellation Prize successor. But most ancient writers lay the blame right at Julia's feet. Tiberius really cannot handle her scandal. I'm a pretty laid-back guy. I imagine him saying. But I draw the line at my wife having sex with other men in public. We can't know how much Agrippina knows about her mother's behavior, but she must be shocked when, around the tender age of 12, Grandpa Augustus publicly shames Julia, accusing her of adultery and exiling her to a tiny island. She will never see her mom again. Imagine what life is like for Agrippina, living in her grandfather's house in the wake of her mother's exile. As she hovers on that line between childhood and adulthood, she has learned a harsh lesson. Blood ties and privilege aren't enough to protect a woman from the emperor's judgment. <sighs> I'd really rather not die on an island, especially if there aren't any infinity pools or buffets. And so she'd better always be on her toes. Augustus was controlling of his family before, but now he'll do anything to keep them from embarrassing him. Everything Agrippina does is watched and controlled. You have to wonder if she chafes at the confinement, wanting to rage against it, longing for a way she can be free. And then, in 2 CE, these dark clouds turn into a hailstorm. Her brother Lucius dies in a training accident, and two years later, brother Gaius follows suit. In her late teens now, Agrippina must be devastated by these losses, but no more so than Augustus. He's just lost the heirs he's poured so much of his time and heart into. He's going to have to rebuild his succession plans from scratch. Livia may well be sad too, but there are plenty of rumors that she actually poisoned the boys somehow to make way for her son Tiberius. I think this is a whole bunch of ancient Roman hogwash, but it does mean that Augustus has no choice but to call Tiberius out of self-imposed exile and line him up to become Rome's next emperor. And Livia will do whatever she can to help him find his way. Augustus officially adopts Tiberius at last in 4 CE, but remember, they're still not blood-related, and in Rome, that really matters. Augustus himself was adopted, sure, but he was a member of Julius Caesar's gens to begin with. Tiberius doesn't have that advantage, so keen for a backup, Augustus also adopts his last living grandson, Agrippa Posthumus. And then he looks to his sister's branch of the family, and his eyes land squarely on a boy named Germanicus. As we started to discover in our last episode, the Julio-Claudian family tree is a vicious tangle of adoptions and many marriages. Add to that the everyone has the same name issue and a headache is bound to ensue. I find that visuals help, so I've made one of the family tree and posted it in the show notes, but let's skate over it quickly. It'll help us make sense of what comes next. At the top are Augustus and his sister Octavia, who form the tree's two main branches. They're both Julii. Then there's Augustus's wife Livia, who's a much revered Claudii. Augustus has one daughter, Julia. Octavia has several kids with several husbands, and Livia has Tiberius and Drusus with her first husband, so they're in the mix as well. 
It gets confusing when Livia, Octavia, and Augustus start marrying their offspring off to each other's. It's not just tangled, but also increasingly dangerous for members of the family. The more descendants there are, the more competition there is, and the more factions might form between its members. These alliances and rivalries will shape all of what's to come. So, which branch does Germanicus come from? Well, it turns out that Octavia and Livia aren't the only matriarchs running this show. When Octavia dies, her daughter Antonia becomes an important player in the family dynamic. Born in 36 BCE, just before Octavia and Mark Antony broke up, she never got to know her wayward father. This seems to be a recurring theme. She grew up in Augustus' household with plenty of cousins and siblings, though. Tiberius, his brother Drusus, wild child Julia, and Antony's many other kids. Always watched and bound by expectation, she went on to marry Drusus, Livia's youngest. And unlike her cousin Julia, Antonia reflects well on her family, dutifully popping out three children without causing any scandals. Then her husband Drusus dies, leaving her a widow at the tender age of 27. She doesn't remarry, choosing instead to be a uni vira, or one-man woman, just like our old friend Cornelia. She's born three children, which means she finds herself in that legal sweet spot those Julian laws created, allowing her a rare kind of emancipation for a woman. The freedom that Julia longs for, but never finds. But Antonia doesn't retire to the country to eat plump figs and read by the pool. She stays on the Palatine, acting as Livia's companion and the family's other matriarch, though it's clear she doesn't quite have Livia's level of power. They raise the Julio-Claudian brood between them, including her children with Drusus, Claudius, Livilla, and Germanicus. All three will have big parts to play in what comes next. Claudius is no doubt the little black sheep of the family, burdened by illness and what scholars now guess was cerebral palsy. Augustus worries a lot about him embarrassing the family. When it comes to any perceived physical frailty, the Romans are not kind. As emperor and paterfamilias, Augustus takes the rearing of all of these kids quite seriously, as we see in this letter he writes to Livia. As you have suggested, I have now discussed with Tiberius what we should do about your grandson Claudius. The question is whether he has, shall I say, full command of his senses? I fear that we shall find ourselves in constant trouble if the question of his fitness to officiate in this or that capacity keeps cropping up. My dear Livia, I am anxious that a decision should be reached on this matter once and for all. You are at liberty to show part of this letter to our kinswoman Antonia for her perusal. The nice thing to note here is that he is making decisions about these kids in close consultation with Livia. The less nice thing is how he treats Claudius like a disease. Livia, too, looks down on him. Antonia, his own mother, is reported to have said that he was a monster, a man whom nature had not finished but had merely begun. Yikes, Mom! But remember that in Rome, matriarchs aren't praised for coddling their children. They're praised for guiding them toward the areas of study that best suit them and for getting them ready for the adult world, harsh as it is. Germanicus, though, he is everybody's favorite. Boisterous, strapping, now this is a boy Augustus can get behind. In 4 CE, Germanicus is 19 years old and full of brawny promise. Tiberius is 44. He's been pulled back to Rome against his wishes, and yet his stepdad still doesn't trust him to run the empire without some young upstart attached to the deal. He suffers in silence when Augustus makes him adopt Germanicus, despite the fact that his own son, Nero Claudius Drusus, is just a few years younger than the boy is. It's Augustus's way or the highway, as usual. You have to wonder if the emperor knows that he's planting seeds of resentment and tension that will grow into choking vines, poisoning his dynasty from within. From the start, Tiberius sees Germanicus as a rival, for Augustus's love, for his own son's prospects, for the empire's appreciation. That sour taste must turn into acid when Augustus makes his next move. He decrees that Germanicus will marry his granddaughter, Agrippina, much-loved daughter of Rome's favorite general, Apple of Augustus's eye. Germanicus is part of the tree already through Octavia, but marrying him to Agrippina will strengthen his ties to the Julii side of the family. This move is clearly meant to mark him as next in line after Tiberius. 
Augustus can dust off his hands with his legacy assured, right? Right? Does the now 18-year-old Agrippina want to marry Germanicus? As per usual, we have no idea. If anyone asked her, they sure didn't write it down. But she will be familiar with him. They probably played together as children. And he's her own age, so that's a massive plus. Add the fact that he's charming, ambitious, strong, and totally swoon-worthy. And it seems her paterfamilias could certainly have done worse. Plus, marrying him means getting out from under Grandpa's thumb and going on her own adventures. You'd think a big ol' wedding would help heal wounds and bury old grudges, but Augustus just can't stop exiling family members. In 6 CE, Agrippina's remaining brother, Agrippa Posthumus, is exiled for his low taste and violent tempers. And then her sister, Julia, is exiled as well. Back in 5 or 6 BCE, Augustus married her off and she dutifully had babies for the dynasty, but apparently she inherited her mother's wild streak. First, she built a big, flashy house in the country, which Augustus disliked so much that he had it torn down. Come on, man! Then she has an affair with a senator named Solanus. True to his conservative family stance, Augustus sends her off to a lonely island, where she gives birth to her lover's child, all alone. Suetonius tells us that Augustus orders the child to be exposed or left out to the elements. Her lover, meanwhile, goes into self-imposed exile, but he's allowed to return to Rome years later. Agrippina's sister, she's left to die in her exile, like her mother before her. In case you weren't counting, here's a little tally for you. Agrippina's father is dead. Her mother is dead because exile. Her sister is dead because exile. Her brother is exiled. She's the only member of her family left standing, and it's all because Augustus won't yield. His harsh decisions do make waves, though, and they're ones that can't be easily smoothed over. There are several petitions to let Julia come home again, all of which Augustus refuses. There are several plots to take Julia and Agrippa Posthumus from their islands by force, but they're all put down. All the while, Augustus loudly curses his female offspring. Every time they're brought up, it's said he sighs, lamenting, Ugh, would that I had never had wedded, and would that I died without offspring. He alternates between calling them his three boils and his three ulcers. You know what, Augustus? I'm starting to hope that Livia does poison your figs. Just saying. And Agrippina must hear his message loud and clear. Luckily, the Roman people are over the moon in love with her and Germanicus. If Rome had a cutest couple award, they would most certainly win it. They're young, they're beautiful, they're personable, perfect poster children for the next generation, shining enough to wipe away the scandals of the past. The uber-hunky Germanicus is put on the political fast track, becoming quaestor in 7 CE, some five years before he's of legal age to do so. He must be a pretty winning orator, because while in that position, Augustus lets him read some of his speeches. Then he rises to consul in 12 at the tender age of 26, given command of some eight legions, that's about a third of the army, stationed in Gaul and Germania. He's about to earn that nickname. I can just feel Tiberius burning with indignant, mopey rage. Let's take a teeny break while I introduce you to another podcast all about women in history. We've got a podcast for you called Broads You Should Know. Broads is one of my very favorite words. I think it's one of the coolest, most underused words. I always thought a broad was like a fast-talking 1940s woman who'd throw on her blazer and go tackle the world. I feel like it's a woman who makes her own rules. A broad doesn't necessarily have to have done something good. Smart, badass women yeah. who had an impact Learn about the broads who help shape our world wherever you listen to podcasts. His successful campaigns over the next few years will make him much loved with the Roman people. Ancient writers blow his greatness up to giant billboard-sized proportions. Tacitus says that his peers believed he outdid Alexander the Great in clemency, self-control, and every other good quality. 
Suetonius gushes about Germanicus. He's smart, he's funny, he defeats all his rivals and never brags. And through most of it, Agrippina travels with him, impressing everyone she meets. It probably helps that she's incredibly fertile. Agrippina must like some serious tent time with Germanicus, because they will have nine kids in total, six of whom will live into adulthood. This is something I'm not sure we dwell on enough in these ancient stories. She goes through, count it, nine births, often in dirty military camps, and lives through every one of them. She buries three of these children, mourning each loss, while also having to soldier bravely on. This gal has got a bun in the oven pretty much all the time. Three boys come first, Nero, though not the one you're thinking of, Drusus and Gaius. At least two were born out on campaign, but it's Gaius who becomes the troop's favorite teeny mascot. They dress him up in a pint-sized military uniform and tote him around camp, earning him a cute little nickname, Little Boot, though in Latin the name's Caligula. A name, it turns out, the boy will never be able to shake. This is a huge point of pride for Agrippina and her granddad, and he isn't above using his great-grandkids to prove his own points. When a bunch of equestrians come before him, complaining about the strictness of his Julian laws regarding its mandate to get married and have a lot of babies, Suetonius tells us that Augustus "...sent for the children of Germanicus and exhibited them, some in his own lap and some in their fathers, intimating by his gestures and expression that they should not refuse to follow that young man's example." But things aren't all coming up roses back in Rome. In Augustus's final years, he starts to really clamp down on the kinds of things people can write and say about the emperor and his family. Little Black Sheep Claudius writes a whole history of the civil wars, which promptly gets pulped because it's seen as too real and potentially embarrassing. And then Augustus makes a trip out to that island where Agrippa Posthumus is being kept. We don't know why he does this. Is he looking to see if his grandson might be fit to get back into the line of succession? To see if he's a threat to it? We don't know whether Livia knows about this trip. Some sources say that Augustus tries to hide it from her, but she uncovers it. Perhaps she becomes worried that Augustus is angling to change his mind about Tiberius being his successor and starts to hatch some secret plans of her own. It's 14 CE now, the year Augustus leaves this earth forever. And that means that, for Livia and Tiberius, for Agrippina and her family, everything's about to change. The Germanicus clan are stationed in the Rhine when the news comes. Augustus is dead. There's a lot of shady rumors surrounding this moment. Does Livia poison her husband before he can change his succession plans? Does she poison the figs at his request because he wants to control when and how he goes out? How much does she stage manage any of this? The sources love to paint her as cool and ever calculating, but I just don't buy her offing Augustus. And it's fair to say that she must feel a lot of sadness in this moment, watching the partner of her life slip away. But there's also this. Just a day after Augustus passes, someone goes to Agrippa Posthumus's island and murders him. Does Livia give the order, not wanting her son to have any rivals? Does Tiberius give the order himself? Regardless, someone kills Agrippina's last remaining brother. She is now the only one of his grandkids left alive, and Germanicus is one step closer to being emperor. It's a position that they'll both have to navigate with care. As Rome goes into mourning, and Livia with it, there is no uproar about going back to a republic. No rebellion against the idea of having one man in charge. Augustus made sure that Tiberius and Germanicus were the public face by the time he died, with everything they needed to step into power. But still, this moment puts Rome on a knife's edge. Can Tiberius step up and fill Augustus' boots? Can anyone? The Senate votes Tiberius princeps, along with the title of Augustus. And Livia becomes Rome's first dowager empress, entering a political wilderness not yet explored by any Roman woman. Imagine Tiberius reading Augustus's will out loud to the Senate, only to stumble upon this gem. Since fate has cruelly carried off my sons, Gaius and Lucius, Tiberius must inherit two-thirds of my property. One last kick in the teeth from old stepdad. Augustus's fortune is ridiculously vast, 150 million sesterces, and a third of that wealth goes directly to Livia. 
This is a huge inheritance for a Roman woman. According to the Lex Voconia, a law that's been on the books since 169 BCE, a woman can't inherit bequests from people with fortunes of more than 10,000 asses, as, as in A.S., a unit of Roman currency, not as in donkeys. Too bad. But since it's Livia, the Senate gives her a special dispensation, so now she's one of the wealthiest women in the Roman world. This windfall is on top of all the farms, brickworks, copper mines, wine presses, and Egyptian olive groves she already owns, and the lands her old friend Salome of Judea bequeathed to her. Livia's already respected and powerful, but in a client-run culture where everyone's always looking for a benefactor, this wealth makes her more powerful still. But Augustus's will also bequeaths her another honor. She's adopted posthumously into his family clan and given the name Julia Augusta. Though sometimes she's just called the Augusta. Damn girl! This makes it clearer than ever that Augustus loved his lady. In some ways, this move elevates her status and makes it on par with his own. The Senate also decides to deify the late emperor, creating a cult of the divine Augustus. I'll bet Julius Caesar would be pleased as punch. And then the Senate is like, You know who else we think is great? Livia. Let's make her the priestess of Augustus's cult. As we discussed with the Vestal Virgins, religious roles give women a rare place of power, prestige, and agency in Rome's official business. Rarer still is a woman actually placed in charge of such a cult. But they aren't done. They also want to grant Livia the title of Mater Patriae, or Mother of Our Country, and change Tiberius's official title so that it includes Son of Livia. Say what? And of course, Tiberius crosses his arms and is like, Uh, back up, Mum. He uses his imperial veto to smack that one down, saying that Only reasonable honors must be paid to women. Whatever, Tiberius. Jealous much? What is the deal between mother and son at this point? Livia is his strongest legitimate link to the emperor's seat, so Tiberius can't exactly push her to the sidelines. But there's a fine line between publicly venerating a female family member, thus pumping up your own image, and having that female cast too big a shadow, as Cassius Dio said. In the time of Augustus, she possessed the greatest influence, and she always declared that it was she who had made Tiberius emperor. Consequently, she was not satisfied to rule in equal terms with him, but wished to take precedence over him. True or not, this marks the beginning of some serious tension between Tiberius and his mother. She's always trying to guide him and the Empire to continued greatness, and he's always trying to confine her role. Mom, for real! I'm a grown-ass man, and I'm going to be my own Emperor. Oh, Tiberius. Perhaps that's why he turns more and more to his advisors. One of them is a guy named Sejanus. The year Tiberius becomes emperor, he appoints him as Praetorian Prefect, which is the head of the emperor's personal guard. This is important to the Agrippinas, so diverge with me for a minute. The Praetorian Guard is an elite unit of the Imperial Roman Army that's been around since the Republic, serving as bodyguards for high-ranking officials. During the Civil Wars, they became important in protecting guys like Mark Antony. Augustus turned them into his own official security. Nine cohorts, each of which usually held about 420 men, tasked with guarding his house and everyone in it. With time, their roles expanded. They stepped in to help with firefighting, did crowd control at gladiatorial games, and even sometimes fought within them, and acted as a kind of secret police. Augustus spread them out around the city, never wanting them to seem like an overwhelming presence. But as the years go on, these bodyguards become confidants as well as protectors, wielding increasing power and influence. Eventually, they will become powerful enough to murder emperors and replace them without any fear. But right now, guys like Sejanus are just bodyguards. Trusted bodyguards. Bodyguards who happen to offer advice now and then to an emperor who has spent his life being dismissed, discarded, and told how he should be. Sejanus wants Tiberius to succeed. He wants to help him, doesn't he? This is a guy who will feature prominently later, so let's leave that dangling ominously for now. The transition of power is not all running smoothly. 
mad about the conditions they're forced to live under and wanting the promises that Augustus made to them honored, some of the legions out in the field start rioting and looting, refusing to be quiet until their demands are heard. These troublemakers know that Tiberius needs their support, and they're going to twist his arm as far as they're able. They're poking the new bear to see if he has claws. When some legions take over their camps, then start looting and pillaging the countryside, going on a big old riotous bender, he goes so far as to send his son Drusus out to bargain with them. That works for a little while, but soon there are mutinies happening on the Rhine, and that means that the hunky Germanicus has to deal with it. He goes over to the mutinous camp, where the leaders say something rather treasonous. They'll take out Tiberius for him and put Germanicus in the top spot, if he promises to help them. Germanicus puts that one down fast with an emotional, drama-filled speech, saying he'd rather kill himself, probably hoping that Tiberius' spies will report that back. No coup fomenting here, adopted dad. Then he settles all the troops' demands, without waiting for Tiberius' permission. Oh, damn. Things get so crazy that a teary Germanicus, it seems he does a lot of crying, begs his pregnant wife Agrippina to flee for her own safety. She's insulted by this suggestion, saying something along the lines of, I am of the blood of the divine Augustus and will live up to it, no matter the danger. Eventually she gives in. Or, ever Augustus's granddaughter, does she decide this is a time for some image-making? She makes a real show of walking through the sea of soldiers in camp, head held high and baby little boot Gaius clutched in her arms. Seeing her make her way out of camp shames the rioting soldiers. To think the granddaughter of Augustus has to leave because they are making it unsafe for her. For shame. And so she does what neither Tiberius or Germanicus could quite muster. She puts the riots to rest without having to promise one damn thing. Agrippina's position in the army already seemed to outshine generals and commanding officers, Tacitus tells us. And she, as a woman, had suppressed a mutiny which the emperor's own signature had failed to check. She steps into a role held by Octavia before her, that of the brave stalwart peacekeeper, a role tailor-made for a woman to play. And though she shares Octavia's fierce loyalty and steadfastness, Agrippina is much more openly passionate, unafraid to fight for what she believes in. She isn't going to be sent back to Rome, bound up in propriety and silence. This lioness is going to stay at the front where she belongs, and she's not afraid to bare her teeth. The problem, Germanicus decides, is that the troops are bored. They need a task to keep them busy. So he takes them across the Rhine to do some pillaging in Germania. Specifically, he takes them back to the Teutoburg Forest. In 9 CE, the legions suffered one of the most humiliating defeats of all time in this forest. It is one of the Empire's greatest sore spots and was one of Augustus's greatest shames. It's a big part of the reason that before he died, he put a stop to expanding the Empire's borders any further. But in a truly brilliant PR move, Germanicus takes them back, again without Tiberius's permission, skirmishing with the Germanic chief responsible for that defeat. It isn't a resounding success, but he does manage to kill a bunch of foreigners and recapture some of Rome's golden standards, which they take into every battle. This makes him an absolute legend. But it does have its touchy moments. Once, when enemy forces threaten to surround and overwhelm his troops, they hightail it toward the bridge the Romans built across the Rhine. The once again pregnant Agrippina has set up a field camp nearby, where she's been nursing the wounded. When the panicked Roman troops suggest burning down the bridge to keep the enemy from getting across it, she stands up, brushes some blood off her stola, and is like, Now boys, let's get it together. She decides they can't destroy the bridge with her standing on it, which she does, welcoming the returning Roman soldiers as they cross. Now that's impressive. As Tacitus tells us, In those days, this great-hearted woman acted as a commander. But not everyone is pleased with a woman in the field, traveling freely and engaging in military action. There are plenty who don't think Agrippina should be there at all. A few years from now, a man named Severus will argue before the Senate that wives shouldn't be allowed to follow their husbands to military postings. A female entourage encourages extravagance in peacetime and timidity in war, he says. Okay, Severus. 
The issue isn't just that they're frail and easily tired, slowing everyone down. No, it's something much more sinister. Relax control and they become ferocious, ambitious schemers circulating among the soldiers, ordering company commanders about. They haven't forgotten Fulvia, the woman who helped raise and command an army against the beloved Augustus. This behavior isn't womanly. And what if her move into the military sphere turns into a move into politics? What's to stop Agrippina from wielding that kind of power? And yet she stays with Germanicus, warrior, wife, and mother lioness. Her naysayers aren't about to stop her. She's also coming behind a bunch of other women that have made similar moves, you know. I, I definitely think of people like Fulvia when I think of Agrippina, you know, as being similarly challenging what is acceptable behavior and, and what is okay. Um and also fighting for your family. You know, There's a lot that you can get away with when you're fighting for your family. One of her children will inherit that fire, determination, and even her name. In 15 CE, she is born Agrippina Minor, or as we'll call her, Agrippina the Younger. We'll leave the Agrippinas there for now, because surprise, this is going to be a three-part episode. Next week, between this episode and part two, I'll have an extra special bonus episode, just in time for the American presidential election. I can't wait to share it with you. Until next time. (laughs) Thanks for listening. If you like the show, become a patron, or tell a friend about it, or leave a review in your podcatcher of choice. It all really helps to get the show discovered. You can also check out my Explores Etsy shop, where you'll find lady-centric maps, timelines, and women's history art prints made by yours truly. If you want to read more about the Agrippinas, go to bookshop.org and look up my Explores bookshelf, where I've curated a list of great reads just for you. Buying through bookshop.org means supporting the Explores, as I get a little kickback, and supporting independent bookstores, so it's really a win for everyone. For show notes, including a transcript, lots of images, and a list of my sources, check out the theexplorespodcast.com. Much of the music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of Michael Levy, whose songs on recreated lyres from antiquity give us a beautiful glimpse into the ancient world. You also heard a track from Damiano Baldoni. You'll find links to both of their works in the show notes. Come find me on Instagram or Facebook at The Explores Podcast and on Twitter at The Explores Pod. Much love to Mr. Explores for my theme song, logo, and for his help producing this episode, and my undying devotion to the following voiceover legends. Catherine Elliott, R.B. Guiling Agrippina. Andrew Dixon, the Cranky Tiberius. Stephen Reichel reprising his role as Augustus. Sean from Stories of Your and Yours podcast as the Caddy Tacitus. Avery Downing as our dour Suetonius. And John Armstrong as Cassius Dio. <laughs> <laughs>